Hello, guys. Um, sorry for uh, the delay in starting the presentation. Um, allow me to present uh, Chetan to give us a presentation on normal struggles with Apache Spark, uh, PySpark workloads in production. Uh, Chetan is a solution architect for data engineering and data science for Action Labs in Bangalore, India. He has got diverse experience in distributed computing and functional programming. He is an open source contributor for HBase, Apache Spark, um, ETC. Um, he speaks at conferences quite often across the globe, and he has worked with um, smaller companies from startups to enterprise. Um, you can take it away. Yeah, thank you, uh, everyone. I'm sorry for our um, delay in setting up the projector. We tested, it was working, and then it wasn't working. Uh, yeah, so uh, I will uh, go li little in fast because we have less time to talk on uh, presentation. So about my introduction, thanks for giving introduction. Like I'm a solution architect and uh, uh, team lead at uh, Action Labs India. Uh, I did open source contribution to Apache Spark and HBase, and uh, I co-authored the university curricula, and I did uh, computer science uh, in master from Kutch University, and. What I do, daily activity is functional programming and Python, Scala, Haskell, data science and product development. So about my company, Excellent Labs is a global service-based company headquartered in Pittsburgh and uh, a development center in Mumbai and Bangalore, India. We work on, uh, yeah, as I said, we have got offices across the globe, uh, 12 offices, uh, US, Canada, and uh, Singapore, Bangalore, India. Uh, in terms of technology stake, we work on big data, AI, um, microservices, uh, QA, RPA, and everything. So uh, I'll talk about the agenda, what we are going to talk in this presentation. So probably I'll talk about uh, Spark internals. So people are, uh, those people are not familiar with Spark internals, they get to know about Spark internals. And then I will talk about the best practices and uh, uh, how the side effects work uh, when you convert the uh, callback from Python to Scala. Since uh, Spark has been written with Scala and works on top of JVM, uh, what things to take care So can I know how many of you have worked with Spark? And how many of you have worked with uh, Spark with Python? And how many of you have worked with Spark and Scala? Yeah, so in this presentation, we'll talk uh, about some of the optimization strategy that uh, we can apply. And this all, all are my experience working with uh, different industry and uh, large set of data. So as you know, Spark is the universal data processing framework, uh, has got some of the components like Spark SQL graphics. And if you want to do ML, you can use MLlib. And if you want to do streaming, you can use uh, Spark streaming and structure streaming. And uh, Spark uh, is a distributed <laughs> framework on top of the Hadoop. So it has got primarily data structure called RDD. Uh, RDD stands for Resilient Distributed Data Set. So it is splitted across uh, uh, different part and uh, distributed to uh, cluster. So it, I mean, so essentially, you can apply your lambda calculus function on top of the each and every split and compute what you want to compute. And at the back end, you can store the, the split of data in SDFS or S3. Those who don't know SDFS is a uh, Hadoop distributed file system. And uh, RDD is z resilient and immutable. So if in the transformation something fails, it has capability to recover and face to the original state and it's immutable, so you cannot change it. And technically, RDD is a compile time safe uh, on top of the JVM, and it, it does strongly type inference. Now, Python coming on typing system, it will work uh, better with uh, Scala. It does lazy evolution, so if you plot the graph, I mean, if you provide the step and transformation, what you want to do with the data, and then you see that, uh, yeah, you grow entire transformation, you zit from the file, and then you tell uh, zit from the table, and then you want to join it and then filter it. So entire graph will be plotted, and uh, when you apply the action, it will start executing that. And Spark has got operations, uh, 
uh, some of them are transformation and some of them are action, as I said. So all the transformation that you can see are lazily evaluated. And when you apply the action, action like you, d you plot the entire graph and you tell that now uh, after all the transformation and joins, you want to write back to the parquet or you want to write back to delta.io, for example, at that time you start executing the executing entire graph. It has got all general purpose operational API and functions with Spark. Uh, I mean, this all are across Java, Python, and Scala. So um, the function names and everything's are same. You can see general purpose, you have got map, filter, flat map, and uh, partition, group by, sort by. For states, uh, you got sample and random simple uh, split. Uh, set theory, you got all this union, intersection, subtract, distinct, and uh, for Data structure in I.O., you have got pipe, uh, you have got queries, uh, zip partition, zip uh, with index, and all this. In action, you got reduce, collect, aggregate, fold, first, take, and this all. Um, uh, to compute the statistical, you got all aggregation, max, mean, sum, histogram, by default, standard deviation, variance, and um, take order. And if you want to save the file, you have got save as text file, save as uh, sequence file, and all these um, actions. So the confusion can be that when to use RDD and when to use data frame. So as I to told that RDD is the primary used uh, abstracted data structures for Spark. So when you don't have the structured data, you can use RDD. And when you don't care about control of a data set and you know that how data looks like, you care about low level API. If you don't care about lots of lambda function that you get in a DSL of the Spark, you can use uh, RDD. If you don't care about schema structure, you can use RDD. If you don't care about optimization and performance and, and inefficiencies, uh, you can use the RDD. And it's very slow uh, earlier, but when Python 3.7 is coming, uh, it will be uh, assuming that the faster performance will be evaluated. And if you don't care about inadvertent inefficiencies, what do I Explain about this means uh, inadvertent inefficiencies means if you do, for example, a filter and then you do map and then you do reduce by key and then you again apply the filter. So this does mean that before I even you do reduce by key, if you can filter out the data, right? So what happened that on when you use the data frame? The catalyst and tungsten engine will optimize your entire transformation and uh, action part, entire your directed acyclic graph. But when you use RDD, it will not optimize that. Um, so in this example, line number 16 does the filter after you do reduce by key. And reduce by key is expensive operation to do suffering on top of the cluster. So probably when you don't care about inadvertent inefficiencies. At that time, you can use RDD. Um, so if I talk about what are the structured options for data structure in Spark, then you have got two things. One is data frame, and one is data set. Other thing, uh, the difference between RDD and data frame is that in RDD, by default, number of partitions are four. But if, if you use a data frame, by default, number of partitions are 200. So what happened that the extreme parallelism that you want to gain or you want to boost on top of the cluster, you need to increase the number of partitions, right? Uh, in structured API, you have got three uh, APIs, SQL, data frame, and data set. So if you use SQL, I mean, probably you can see some of the people just use the Spark or SQL and use entire SQL query and then try to query everything. So what side effect and how, um, how it can impact the productivity of the uh, developer that is uh, here. SQL, uh, you can catch syntax error runtime. You can catch analysis error runtime. For example, you write SQL query and you see that the column name is incorrectly typed over there probably that transformation comes after eight hours. So then you will spend eight hours on the cluster and then you understand that this has failed. Then again, you go back and change your code and again you do it, right? So by the way, it takes development times of 10 minutes and uh, understand that is, is there any error or not, it takes eight hours for you, right? Um, when you can use data frame, um, it can give you syntax error on compile time, but if you want uh, uh, 
uh, analysis error, you can get that also in runtime. But the third API called Dataset API, which is not, which was not, which wasn't supported earlier with Python, but with Python 3.7 and type safety uh, packages, it has been uh, in experimental uh, uh, stage at this point of time. So syntactical error, you can catch compile time. You can catch analysis error compile time. Um, let me show you some of the code that how it, it, it explains here. That in, in this example, you can see that I had a RDD, and I want to convert to data frame. So I'm saying that past RDD to data frame and column name I'm providing. Then I'm doing data frame dot filter. Writing lambda and saying that first argument is equal to finance, and then doing group by, and then doing aggregation on number of stories, and saying as count. And I'm saying limit of 100, and so only 100. So if you see this line also, limit of 100 and showing 100, that can also improve a, a bit performance. Because if you do so 100, probably Spark will fetch everything and cut it down and show you 100. But here you are saying you only fetch 100 for all executors and, and give you this. Also. You can do the same thing with SQL view, data frame, and SQL query. You can create a temporary view, and then say SQL query here, same business logic and functionality. And then you can say so uh, to show the output. So the, how internally it works, right, in Spark. So Catalyst in Spark has got SQL AST and data frame and data set. This all goes to a Zizor logical plan. And from this, it will figure it out logical plan, and then the API talks to Catalyst, uh, Catalyst uh, engine, and then gives you optimized logical plan. And from that, it will <coughs> do statistics and check the performance and give you the optimized physical plan. And it will create the cost model and select the physical plan for that. And at the end, it will convert to RDD. Now, you might be confused that why we are coming at the end to RDD back. This RDD that you can see, this is highly optimized Java bytecode runs on JVM, this one. So this RDD is not the same RDD that we were talking about earlier. At the end, as I said, that RDD been primarily uh, used to data structure for Spark. This is the different RDD that I'm talking about. At the end, as you know, even though if you spy Spark or Scala, Scala itself uh, executes on JVM. So at the end, everything has to connote to bytecode, which runs on JVM. Yeah, this is one example of data frame optimization. If you have the data frame called employees, you want to join with event, and then you do join here, and then you apply filter here, events, date, whatever, right? So even though you can see, probably you can do first filter, and then you can do join here. But because of the catalyst optimization engine, it can change your logical plan and physical plan and tell you that, oh, you can do pruning here and post down and column you can get here. Yeah, this is fine. So this was primary abstraction and data structure about Spark. Now we'll talk about Spark internals. It's very uh, important to understand that how it works. When you submit your code, what things goes well and how internally it behaves, right? Um, uh, so we'll talk about what do I mean by executor, score, container, state, job, and task. So Spark internals terminology. Job means each transformation and action mapping in Spark would create a separate jobs. So when you provide when you create a directed acyclic graph means deck, and and then you provide um, transformation and job. You do join, you do filter, then you do flat map for example. This all creates an internal one on job, right? And what is stage? A set of tasks in each job which can run parallel using thread pool executor. So when you have a stage, can have the combination of uh, job internally. And then it can e execute that uh, on parallelly. Probably it can execute on partitions. And uh, task is lowest level of concurrent and parallel execution unit in Spark. So each stage is split into number of partition task. When you have stage, it has got number of partition. So probably you, you, you can provide equation like number of task is equal to stages into number of partition in the stage. So I if you want to compute that which transformation is taking higher task, higher number of tasks, or how it happened, right? So when you go to DAG, and when you see the DAG um, on a UI or Spark UI, and if you see that I want this specific transformation or specific stage to 
uh, execute faster. So then you can create uh, extra number of partitions and boost the parallelism here. But if you understand that how you can increase the number of tasks is stage into number of partitions in the stage. How it looks, it looks like this. these are the jobs on Spark, you can see. And this is a stage here. Inside the stage, you can see jobs. And uh, you can see how stage get allocated to which executors. Um, what is executor? Executor is nothing. One virtual um, node, uh, which has got one separate JVM. So it just spawn up separate JVM where it works. And you can see this number of tasks. Uh, yeah. And then it's also important to understand that how you can allocate number of memory resources and this and everything to um, uh, Spark jobs. So when you execute your Spark on Yarn, Yarn is similar to kind of uh, orchestration and provide you the virtual containerized application for Spark. So Spark create the container, uh, Yarn create the container, and on that container it execute the job. So to control that, you have got uh, these parameters, yarn or scheduler uh, allocation virtual cause is one, and uh, maximum allocation of virtual cause six, and uh, how much uh, you can allocate the memory maximum and the uh, upper bound and lower bound. And uh, if you want to control that number of job can submit it together, because if you provide higher uh, resources to your Spark, sorry, Spark submit, and then what happened that if you want to run only one job and tune that one job, then it works. But if you think that you have got some of the tables uh, which, uh, which pulls the data parallelly and some of the tables can do transformation and you want to utilize the entire cluster resources and make sure that nothing is spent over there and then you can complete the entire workflow in uh, um, provided SLA, then you need to configure these parameters because if Let's say three jobs that you submitted takes all the memory, and the other five jobs are in accepted mode, then probably you can't tune the entire your workflow. What you need to do is understand the volume of data and understand the SLA, and accordingly change these parameters. The formula equation you can see at the end, number of maximum containers you can run. Each container, assume each one Spark job, is, is the yarn.nodemanager.resource.memory-mb. Uh, whatever it is, for example, here is 14,000, uh, 54,000 uh, MB, and yarn dot scheduler minimum allocation MB is this, uh, 4,096. Uh, 4, so even if you divide that uh, 54,000 by 4,096, you can run 13 container at uh, best case scenario. Um, yeah, you can see that which node has how many calls with this command. How you can tune these parameters? So I'm using the Ambari UI. Also, you can configure manually. Uh, you can see um, container. How many you can uh, provide configuration virtual call? M minimum is here ten, and then you can tune this. Uh, as you can see, after changing here, you can see it is 32 virtual calls. And after changing, you can see 52 virtual calls. So I mean, you can also change this configuration. It's not only fixed configuration for Spark. And uh, if it is configured and tuned, uh, and then if you submit Spark submit, probably you will not be able to submit that. It, it will give you error saying that you requested uh, this number of virtual calls, and maximum virtual configured virtual calls are six. So anyway, any other developer working with your team cannot submit and, and, and give you trouble. Um, Spark scheduler is FIFO. You can also change to FAIR. When you can change, when you want specific jobs to um, scale that. So, I mean, as you know, the Spark is lazily e evaluated, but if you want eager execution in between runtime, so then you can change your Spark's, I mean, specific code. Let's say you have got one Spark job, now Spark runs uh, lazily, but you want e eager execution model in between for sm some code block, then you can provide spark.config.set uh, the Spark scheduler to FIFO to FAIR and use that code and again change that. So for that code block, it will change the uh, scheduler for Spark and uh, change your uh, behavior of Spark job. So parallel read from JDBC. Um, so 
So also, when you work with JDBC, uh, as some of you have uh, experienced that Spark tried to read on one executor. You can't tune that, right? So on, on that scenario, um, it is not clearly written on the uh, documentation, but uh, uh, what happened that if you can see this code, uh, uh, this code, when you read the sample table, it, it, it uses only one executor. Since anyway, if you have allocated the five executors, for example, and other executors are idle, but it is allocated to that container. That does mean other job cannot even use those resources, even though it's required. So how you can understand this? For example, in this is, this scenario is a SQL server. So I'm using this session and process and figuring out number of connections established on RDBMS, and which tells me that um, number of connections are only one each. And then I also see the impact on SQL server. Uh, it tells me uh, you can, I can use this query and figure out impact. Uh, if you want to change the parallel JDBC read, so if you can see the number of uh, partition here, so this number of partition is not that RDD partitions. This argument num partition is number of connection that you want to establish to pull the data from table. And upper bound and lower bound is the boundary that you have got data and that the five will divide that numbers. Probably people use the column name as the primary key, so you have got the numbers over there, and then you can divide and establish the connection, and parallel it will pull the data, and then it will uh, uh, do <coughs> data calls together. And then you can see that uh, executors have been uh, activated here. Also, I mean, I have wrote some util uh, function which can just you provide the kind of a Spark um, uh, context and the query. It will figure it out the minimum and maximum boundary, and then you can use that argument of tuple of uh, list over there. Same function I have provided for table and query. And then you can see here that after changing that code uh, on SQL Server, I can see that uh, uh, 15 queries are uh, connection established and trying to pull everything, and then this is this has been reduced seven x performance of the. Um, I mean, this has increased seven x performance for the same Spark code. Also, that uh, when you work with specifically RDBMS nowadays, so it read row by row, and when you try to write, it also write row by row, and this is expensive. What's best way for read, which I told you, and if you want to do write, uh, it's best way to use some bulk load APIs of Spark. So in this case, I'm using Azure bulk load API, and which can um, does bulk load. This is a definition of the function. You can provide the you know, bulk load batch size, so it can um, write in batch. Probably right now all the RDBMS supports this mechanism, and then you can do bulk load table lock true, and then you can. Uh, just um, uh, get all power of uh, bulk load and, and spawn this. Bulk load API versus JDBC write, which I told you that how it's faster. Uh, also, optimization strategy for joins. Um, as you know, Spark has got two type of joins, sort merge join and broadcast has join. And by default, Spark does sort merge join, and if you can see, so what happened that when you do join, it does shuffle. If you have two data frame, if you join with two data frame, this will get shuffled across the entire cluster. And as you know, if you increase shuffling, it takes time to complete your job. Now, if if you provide better plan and the um, and the performance optimization strategy, which can reduce this shuffling, then you can achieve. Uh, great optimization and performance for the Spark job. So what it does that when you see the one data frame is small, it doesn't matter left side or right side even. One data frame is small, you can just uh, broadcast that to all the nodes. That does mean you just copy that data frame to all the nodes, so when it does the join, it's faster. And uh, by default size is 10 MB, but you can change that to the way you want. And also that when you have like when you are joining that, if if this side partitions and this side partitions are same, then it's faster to join between same partition with the same data. How you can do it? Let's say on this side you can do repartition by the column on top of which you are joining, and then you can do bucketing. So partition is a uh, it will create the f kind of directory structure on the for, uh, data frame, and then it has got only those data which you are joining. If you are joining on let's say invoice ID then all the data for those inverse ID will be in a same partition. 
And if you want to increase, you can use the partition. If you want to decrease, you can use call as. And this will impact on network communication, file I.O., network I.O., bandwidth I.O. This you can all tune this. Yeah, um, as you can see, order doesn't matter. This can uh, reduce the suffering and boost parallelism. Uh, partitioning, bucketing, callers, the partition, and has partitioner are those API which can tune your all Spark jobs. You can see optimization part on the DAG and see that which uh, job is happening with how much data. You can see 97 MB here. Somewhere you can see 6.7 GB of shuffle happening. So you can literally, you can literally uh, trace the DAG and see that what is happening after what and how much suffering is happening each time. Probably sometime if you do um, uh, persist and case, it will reduce the suffering. Yeah, these are examples. Since we don't have time, I'm just um, going on high-level architecture. This presentation will be shared with everyone. So I will talk about the case study and uh, high-level architecture. Probably we'll keep uh, less time for the questioning. And then if there's a question, we can talk offline or outside. Uh, this is very important um, uh, to understand. So this high-level architecture, the use case was we had O o online transaction processing system, and then from we get log shipping data to Sado data source, and then we have Spark SQL and some of the scoop to read data in Parquet and HDFS, and it does Spark SQL here, and we do bulk load to customer specific reporting DB. Understand this has this is um, data mart and this is transactional database. And this all Spark jobs has been orchestrated and scheduled with Airflow. So yesterday, uh, probably some of you have seen, uh, I mean, attended talk of Sina. She was talking on Airflow. Um, but uh, th I mean, I will show you some of the things with specific to ETL and Spark jobs uh, with Airflow, how you can schedule this. So this is the sample demo code which I uh, generated yesterday for you. Um, so. As you can see, uh, technically you can uh, scale. I mean, sometimes what happens, the output of one Spark job is input for other Spark job, right? And if that job fails, then there's no point to start second job. And you see that some of the, some of the tables are master table, and there's no dependency. So you, you can s group together and execute all those master table uh, together in parallel and get all the staging data on your HDFS. And then you can uh, do transformation on transitional data. And sometimes you might need some um, technique to tell first time do historical load, but second time if, if historical load is done for specific customer ID, then do incremental load. So at that time, how the branch operator can help you and those are uh, so the light on that. Uh, also, it can, uh, how can I open this? Yeah. It was so simple. You have to get from this side. It's not working. We'll wait for some time, uh, as I'll show you the. Yeah, so here you can see that uh, what I have done is that uh, got all the Spark submit in Airflow, and then scheduled that Airflow by passing the external configuration from the API. So I if I just uh, put the REST call, that run my entire workflow for this customer ID. So specifically, all those external parameters been uh, provided from API. So then you, you have got one UI with AngularJS or whatever it is, and then you select it, and people doesn't know what's happening in the background. I, I mean, probably this is kind of product that I was working on. And then 
uh, as you can see, you can this is a curls. Uh, you you can pass this all uh, run ID and from runtime. And then uh, if, if you want Spark submit operator, it is uh, available as a plugin with the Airflow com ecosystem. But this is the best operator inheritance from that. So the only problem is that if you want to pass the uh, values from one operator to other operator, the way is you can do expul. Uh, or if you um, if, if I wanted to pass the data from uh, one operator to other operator, I need to change the plugin itself. So then I have used uh, base operator itself and use Spark submit command as it is. References are available here. So I have set up the Airflow cluster with Debit, MQ, and Celery. Um, so I have got uh, scheduler on different side, worker on different side, and uh, other things on different nodes. So you can see this all the resources here. Um, let me check if uh, is that? <coughs> yeah, it's open. Sorry. Yeah, here we go. Um, I can't see. I'll just explain you here that, uh, as you can see here, all the Spark jobs are being provided here. Uh, and uh, you can set up the variable. And uh, those variables will be available here to get the data from values uh, here. These are the, um, actually, in Airflow, you can store key value pair in variable also, and then you get it. So there's a, pra there's a branch operator which you can use, and then, uh, and then you can tell that uh, whether historical job is done or not, and then it can provide a different flag to you. Uh, just let me show you the one minute. In this Python file, I have stored all this operator in definition. So all this configuration that you can get is stored in dictionary, so you can get on key value pair. And then if you want to establish connection, uh, you can get here. The important thing is the method for best operator for RDBMS, which can have the those changes, and uh, you can pass the values which we need, and you can trigger these. This is Spark submit operator where y you can see all these um, key value pairs are given here, dynamic allocation and whatever you need, and then you can just spark the all hyperparameters for Spark job is, uh, uh, is the signature here for this method, and then you can pass this and execute as you need this, and um, you can execute some Unix command in form of HDFS which you need it to check that. Sometimes, if you want to create the flag, you can create create the touch file on Spark. And then you can tell touch file is there or no, if you want that communication. And uh, all your Spark job dependency, you can handle on these um, set upstream and set downstream way. And then you can uh, execute these Spark jobs. I don't know internet is not working properly. Yeah, that's it. Any question? Um, thank you very much, Shetan. Uh, we're going to take one question because of time. If there are any questions, one question from the audience. OK, so um, uh, perhaps I misunderstood. Uh, there's a part in your presentation where you talk about um, speeding up the 
display of, of, uh, of a piece of data using limit 100. Um, so what actually happens there, and you'll notice it when you run it on a sufficiently large data set uh, with a sufficiently complex query, um, limit doesn't actually give you the first 100 elements and stops ex execution from there. It in fact computes all of the partitions and then takes 100 elements. So it doesn't actually speed up the um, the show of, of an element at all. Yeah, the only so way to get around that is using take, which is in the RDD Yeah, interface. so I, I'll tell you how it, uh, if all the data is, is available in, in the same partition, then we have seen then it will give you, it, it doesn't uh, ma matter whether you do limit or no, but if data is available across different partition, this case is different, like drop duplicate, right? So that's what we experienced in Spark 2.3. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to take a very quick break for switching between stations and setting up for Enroute.